Here's a rare one. We got the 1970 Kawasaki A7 Avenger with the electronic ignition, the rotary inducted twin cylinder two stroke. This happens to be our resident professor, Billy Blythe's bike. Yeah. It's that's bike. going on the chopping block. And uh, there's, oh man, some providence with this one. So, Billy, what's the scoop of this bike? Tell us the story. Well, Kenny, this bike came to me from our oil man from the uh, oil service company. He was over the house one day and he says, hey, Billy, I got a bike. It's in the boxes. He says, how'd you like to put it together for me? So I went over to his house and it literally was in pieces. It had arrived at the dealership back around 1972 that he worked at as a parts man. And he, the customer came in for an engine top end rebuild. So the factory technician rebuilt the engine. The guy paid for it and disappeared. He probably uh, unfortunately passed away or moved away and forgot about his Kawasaki A7. So after a period of time went by, the dealership bought the bike and, and our friend Scotty bought it, my oil man. And Scotty brought it home and uh, life changes. He had twins, uh, twin children. And uh, in the meanwhile, he'd taken it all apart. I mean all apart, except the engine. He left the engine all together, but the wheels were apart, the spokes were out of it, everything was apart, but it was all original and stock. And he asked me one day if I'd like to try and put it together for him, so I did. I went over and picked the bike up, and uh, literally it was in bits and pieces. But I brought it home, and uh, in a couple weeks I had it together, and, and uh, the bike is in original trim, the seat is original, original seat cover, original uh, gas tank paint, the stainless steel fenders are still in great shape. I had the side covers matched and repainted, and the graphics are aftermarket, but they're as close to exact as you could get for, uh, for graphics for this bike. A company in Canada makes them. So I got it all together and, and uh, blew him away when he came over to take a look at the bike when I asked him to come see it. You know, after a couple of weeks, he came back and says, wow, I can't believe it's all together. But it sat for many years in, in my shop in a dry place, and I never started it. And uh, we came to terms here. I brought it down, uh, and the boys in the service department went through it from stem to stern. Jimmy uh, actually took the carbs off, found they were on the wrong side. I put it together incorrectly, but uh, um, he got it all sorted and running properly, and uh, it is a really good running motorcycle. There's, uh, there's more to the story about this design of motorcycle. Go ahead, Bill. It was um, initially, I think, Kawasaki. I was told this by a guy that worked for Kawasaki for some 50 years. He was in on the uh, Kawasaki H1 project, and the guy was from England. He raced the Isle of Man. He had some provenance, some, some history, and Kawasaki hired him in the late 60s to reinforce the frame on the H1. Uh, prior to that, uh, the H1 uh, was going to be based on this model. And this model, the carburetors are in the side cases on both sides, so the engine is fairly wide for a twin because the carburetors reside inside these cases. Uh, the disc valve induction is inside that. Uh, the induction goes into the, crank, into the crankshaft, so um, it's kind of like a supercharger in a way. And it's very uh, uh, exact timing with the rotary disc valve induction. Kawasaki was trying to add a third cylinder to this engine. They couldn't do it practically um, because of the fact that uh, the, the third cylinder and rotary valve in the center just couldn't happen. So instead of spending a fortune on the, the, the bike, they redesigned the engine, made it piston port, air-cooled uh, 500. So this bike uh, kind of died on the vine at the, that point. This design, they ended their, piston, their um, re, uh, rotary disc valve induction program, I think, with this model. So they didn't make any more other than small bore uh, 125s and 175s with disc valve. So this bike you know, lives on as it was in 1970 in, in very good condition. It's not seen a lot of use. There's some scars from falling down on this side on the right, but uh, the, the hand grips, all the, uh, all the stock components are still here, the levers, you know, the gauges with the stickers still from the factory in place. Um, you see, um, there's signs of wear. Uh, these fork boots were in great shape until I started moving the forks a little bit and then they came apart. But they had been, those are the originals over 50 years old and, and very easy to replace. But I left them stock. I, I wanted them to be as, as they were originally. So uh, it's got period correct stock uh, style tires like Dunlop K70s. Those are uh, fairly uh, accurate to what the bike had on it originally. 
It's got a double leading shoe front brake, performance oriented uh, drum brake, and also a drum on the back. Um, it's, this bike is capable of well over 100 miles an hour, and uh, I've never ridden it that fast, but uh, I've never actually ridden it, but around the parking lot here. You know, Bill, um, guys, Jimmy Laurinaitis, Jimmy Laurinaitis uh, he's one of our brilliant techs in the service department. Uh, he took his time and went through the bike. We'll read off his work order, and it, it is just running, as I would imagine, as new. And the first test ride that I rode on the bike, Billy, just it was an absolute joy. The transmission shifted right into gear, silky smooth, fired up easily, um, and just getting into the power, just very clean, very smooth, yeah. brakes on point. Uh, just an absolute joy to ride, really, um, and, and an easy machine to get going. Um, just this showed me really how, how good they were so early on. I mean, this is a, feels what I would consider a very uh, well refined uh, mo motorcycle, and I, I would imagine a lot, a lot of that has to do with the electronic ignition that came from the factory and the rotary disc induction. It's a shame that they uh, weren't able to stick with this design for the triples because I think they would really have something if they could have figured that out because this is just a delight to ride. Yeah, without a doubt. If they could have figured out how to put the uh, disc valve induction on the, the center cylinder, that would have been a, it would have been a whole different uh, game. Even though the H1 500 triple was a monster, uh, with, with rotary valve induction, it would have been even more of a motorcycle. But this is... Um, I think the result of a lot of effort on Kawasaki's part to make something fast and reliable. Uh, this is a bike that you could uh, go touring on, or it's a bike you could ride around town. Uh, it doesn't foul out because it's so uh, hyper. It's, uh, it's, it's well muffled, quiet, uh, runs good in the mid-range, but if you ask it, it will deliver. Mm. It, it, it's got a power band, and, uh, but not a violent one. It's very, uh, very simple, easy to ride bike. You know, steering damper from the period. Look at this, how crude is this, huh? Oh, it's got neat. this steering damper here, and it's got another one on the frame over here, a hydraulic one. So we've got, uh, you know, I don't know if Kawasaki was worried about the wobbles. Maybe they were, but these are factory items that are on the bike from, from, the, from the works. Billy, this profile right here with the, uh, the head pipes coming out, just the fin cylinder, the profile of the tank, is a nice flat sort of streamlined design. And then the seat, especially with the seat strap and the trim here, and how it kind of comes up in, in the rear. This is like, this is real craftsmanship right here. And the fact that the original seat's in this kind of condition, it looks like the leather was shampooed and, and it looks yeah. like it's <laughs> brand new, man. So, uh, Billy, thank you for preserving this thing and, and just freaking fantastic. A lot of times you see the fenders crinkled up, you know, whether, you know, a beginner would jump on them and they'd smash them against the wall or back into them in the garage or a rake would fall on them. This is a super straight example. And uh, I mean, well stored, well, well uh, uh, preserved, classic. And now it's, uh, you know, freshly serviced and ready to go. I would say she needs nothing. Right, exactly, I would say the same thing. You know, it's got a minor scuff on the other side on the muffler, not a minor scuff, it's got a, a scuff that goes all the way down the full length of the muffler. I never noticed this until you pointed it yeah, out, Bill. Yeah, it's on the underside, so you really don't notice it, but uh, I did shop around a bit and I found uh, replacement mufflers, but I chose not to buy um, any replacement muffler because this is still functioning and it's not an eyesore to me. And right, well, it's not like it's smashed in, maybe a little dimple or yeah. something, but I mean, it's, it's really, uh, the bike still shows shows well, and, and the original components, like the controls, weren't uh, weren't hit or scarred in really any way. There's no dent in the tank or anything like that. So maybe a low speed tip over, huh, Bill? Yeah, yeah, per probably and most likely because, you know, this is in the days before they had frame sliders, and right. you know the pipe took a hit. And I think it took everything. I don't think there's any other part on the bike that shows any sign of uh, of an accident. Uh, there is a dent or a scratch. <laughs> no, there is a uh, few broken fins here, and I think that happened uh, before I got my hands on the engine in uh, storage. Mm. Uh, but uh, as far as the paint goes, this is original paint on the fuel tank, on the headlight bucket. You know, so the side covers are the only thing that was repainted, to my knowledge. The frame's original paint, and I never touched it up. Uh, the boys in detail may have, but I, I didn't see any evidence of it anywhere. So it's really a great original bike that would be good for riding or good for uh, showing. 
Jimmy wrote up the work order and this will be noted in the eBay description as well. So in case you don't feel like sitting through this, new battery, new UASA battery, new spark plugs, new clear fuel lines, inline fuel filters, new Pecock packing kit. Billy, can you open up the tank and show us the tank interior? Sure. New carburetor uh, vent lines, full carb service on both carbs, dunk them in the ultrasonic tank. How's inside of the tank, Billy? Let's see if we can get my flashlight in there. I would say really nice. It, it's, <clears throat> for a 50 year old bike, I don't think it would any better than that. There can't be anything any better. New spigot O-rings, service both choke plungers, adjusted the choke free plate, synced the cables, polished both carb bores for free carb slide bores. operation, Thank you. Thank you. synced both carb slides, lubed all the cables, filled the oil injection tank, bled the system, verified the oil pump operation, so that is all working uh, as factory, filled the oil injection tank, uh, adjusted the oil pump cable, new petcock packing, uh, double stated that, petcock's all rebuilt, no worries there. Uh, two gallons of VP fuel at 70 to one for the first fire up and run in, confirming that the oil tank ran properly. Uh, a little rich, no problem. Uh, Jimmy noted that the bike runs excellent. No surprise there. Verified charging system and lights operation. And then he noted that the clutch plates were stuck together. So uh, from sitting, because it sat uh, the majority of his life, right, Bill? Yes. And then uh, he removed the clutch plates, cleaned the steel plates and reassembled. Checked for proper clutch operation, noted that it works excellent, reassembled it, and added new transmission oil. Let's we'll see if there's anything not noted on the work order in the parts list. Looks like it's all there. So carbs rebuilt, Pecock rebuilt, uh, confirmed uh, proper operation of the charging system. It's got a new battery. Um, clutch has been serviced. Fuel tank's clean, fresh fuel, non-ethanol, of course, oil ejection pump. All the controls are in order. Uh, no surprises or issues mechanically. And under the seat, how, do, how are we, Bill? Uh, it looks uh, clean and new. Uh, we've got uh, the electronic ignition brains right there and a brand new battery sitting down inside, but it doesn't show signs that it's ever really been dirty. I mean, the fender here matches the fender here, which is unusual. You know, usually you see underneath, it'll be better preserved than the rest of the bike, but it's a no excuses bike. This is not a crusty barn fine turd. This is one that was in the family uh, and, and one that the origins are clear from the very beginning. So Billy, yes. hats off. Uh, thank you for curating this. Uh, just fantastic and uh, brought back to life by the boys here on staff. So this will be offered for sale. I think Billy's gonna shed a tear uh, when this one goes. Uh, <laughs> it's almost <laughs> like I wanna buy my own bike back. Yeah, now right. that I've seen it run and seen it up on its wheels, you know, out in this beautiful uh, museum, uh, it's just, it's begging for me to ride it, but um, it's gonna have to go down the road. If, uh, if the auction does really well, uh, I think Billy's gonna get uh, a small bonus. <laughs> <laughs> Billy, thanks for bringing this one down to us. Uh, I look forward to seeing your, your matchless single get started. So what's the scoop? What do you trade uh, uh, this bike for? <laughs> well, I won't bore you with a long story, but the short end of it is <clears throat> I traded it for a 1964 matchless trials bike, and I've been a trials rider for about 50 years, going on 50 years next month. And uh, this bike I've known since I was 14 years old, 50 years ago. And the matchless uh, came to us through uh, <laughs> the long way around, but we wound up getting it. It crossed my path so many times that I thought one day, why don't I offer to buy the matchless? So I, I needed to, Jill said, no more bikes without getting rid of one. So the Kawasaki was there, it was all in one piece, and I wasn't using it, and um, I wanted to see it go to a better home. Uh, so it was a perfect fit to get, you know, get the matchless and, and take the Kawasaki in. So. Uh, the matchless will be, or the other way around. Yeah, so uh, definitely. So we did, did a little trade gig. Looking forward to seeing the matchless get, get running, Billy. And, and uh, guys, need a shipping quote, message your zip code. Call us, 860-454-7024. Billy runs the phone lines 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. You can talk and speak with him on this bike. Um, no excuses. Uh, no title on the bike, but I can obtain title easily. Uh, ask us about our title program, call right. the shop, ask to speak with Junior. Uh, we can take care of you there. Otherwise, uh, any other remarks, Bill? No other remarks. It's a no excuses motorcycle. It uh, has got many years of uh, fun left in it. Thanks a lot, man. Guys, if you watch this far, uh, hey man, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you on the next one. God bless America. God bless America.